Hello and welcome to Skandia Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram as Skandia and I'm a designer called Skandia Knits on Ravelry and that's also why I have a Ravelry group called Skandia Knits. And I don't know how many takes I needed to just say I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. I'm, I'm not sure why I'm not entirely up to speed here mentally. It might be because it is a little bit late as you can probably see with the slight change of light which is obviously I am very hyper aware of because it's I'm producing this whole damn thing. Anyway, this is my knitting podcast. If you're new to this, this is where I sit and talk about knitting for about every week, other week, every third month, depending. <laughs> it was supposed to be weekly. It was once upon a time. I'm to a returning viewer. Hello and welcome back. Um, this episode was kind of very much improvised when I realized I will have about 30 minutes of alone time in the living room before the sun sets. I was like, okay, we're gonna cram this in and I can already tell it's not really the best light situation for that. But that's actually a good idea because today <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do a review. Yeah, uh, contrary to popular belief, it's not really the case that someone who has a knitting podcast gets sent a whole bunch of things. But every so often, it happens. The <laughs> A mythological being that is this lamp that I'm looking at right here. So this is the lamp. I'm not going to talk about it until the very end of the episode, but it's here. So Ben Q decided to send me this lamp because they were curious to hear what knitters think about this lamp because they think it's going to be good for for knitters. Um, and I will tell you what I think about that at the end of the episode. Um, I do think it's really cool. I, I, I No spoiler, but uh, I also have some mixed feelings, so it's, it's going to be good. Uh, so stay tuned for that in the end because I'm hoping, I'm actually hoping it's going to get dark so I can show you the actual lamp. That's something. Uh, but before that, we're just going to talk about just knitting. I am going to try to cram in quite a few things such as I am running the Knit Along Skin Knits Garment Cal of 2021 where all you have to do is start and finish uh, one or several of my garment patterns and submit it to the finished objects thread that I need to start in the Ravelry group and then... I will be drawing winners at the end of the year. I should really be doing a slideshow, but I doubt they'll have time to put one together for this episode. So maybe we'll have a, a really nice big one for the next one. So maybe you wanna get your photos up for that one. And yeah, uh, what else is there? I have patterns. <laughs> so this is kind of awkward just because of my long break. I've not really been able to share the progress. So they're not actually works in progress or finished objects that like actually published patterns. Um, you will see why, because the first one is a baby onesie and of course I gave it to my nephew. So I don't have it here to show you. I wish I could. Um, it was a really quick knit so I would barely have had time to show you before I like gave it to him and the whole ordeal. So it, I'm gonna try to tell you about it while you can watch some adorable photos of his royal ador adorableness. <laughs> uh, this is a top-down raglan. I really do not do many top-down raglans. I don't know that I've ever designed a single one actually now that I think about it. Because uh, I do generally think they are better suited for babies than a broad spectrum of sizes for adults. So I finally had the, I guess, the chance to, to do a raglan for uh, children's sizes from half a year old to four years. Um, I know I have in the past made smaller sizes. I, I think the smallest I've done is like a quarter of year age and I thought about it, but actually I've just realized you don't really want to knit anything that size. You'd rather just have your little baby wear something really too big and just, they, they grow so fast. Uh, they just grow really fast. But the thing is like length with this thing is adjustable pretty much everywhere, whether you want to lengthen or shorten the yoke or the sleeves or the legs or the body. So the once it is knitted in the relatively new Vidde yarn by Hillesvog. And you guys know I am absolutely nuts when it comes to Hillesvog. They're just, they're my favorite. Uh, one of my favorites, the favorite, definitely my favorite Vil, Vil, Mill to visit. I haven't been there in so long. It's a mill outside of Bergen in Norway. Vida is sort of new, I mean it is new, <laughs> and it is a lamb's wool pelt wool blend. So Hillesvog is known for their pelt wool. I do believe the original like breeding of that breed of sheep was made for the mill or in their families or something like that. And they mix that pelt wool with lamb's wool so they can have sort of more, I guess the colors you can't achieve with the pelt wool alone which they also have with Vida, which is why I keep 
mixing them up. Because they're both their new worsted weight yarns, though I would argue you can easily knit them up to iron weight, and that's kind of what I've done with the Librarian onesie. So it's the same yarn that I used for the Librarian pullover for adults, the one that I have for myself. And it's just, it's cute. I really like it and it's really fun as well and it doesn't have that much of the librarian pattern on it. Uh, side note by the way if anyone's like oh, it's a lot of cables I'm like it's not cables it's, it's not it's a twisted stitch pattern and I don't know why I was like fully unaware of twisted stitch patterns until fairly recently especially as I have done twisted stitch patterns in the past I just hadn't really registered I guess the full potential of these stitches and so now I'm all over uh, that and I want to do it with with everything so anyway that's just all twisted stitches and no cables and twist twisted stitches are a lot easier trust me and there's a bit of short rows actually for the for the back just because diaper bumps they need a bit of space bumps need space in general uh, and I think that's about it yeah it's it just it was a fun knit as a quick knit it does have a steak so if you ever want to have a go at your first steak that's you know an option I doubt it's very hard to, to modify to work fly if you insist, but I, I would always encourage people to steak. I get people telling me all the time, like, I really want to steak, I'm going to do it soon, I think I will, I think I want to, and I'm like, just do it, just do it. You're never going to look back. Like, I've never had a person say, I've tried steaking and never again. No, people always want to do it. Even those who have, like, bad experiences, which is, like, 0.0001% or something, <laughs> they still want to do it again because they want to, like, get it right the next time. So, like, I never really had anyone regret steaking. So that's that pattern uh, already at my nephew's. He probably... He, he better love it. I mean, he looked like he loved it when he was wearing it outside and keeping him nice and warm. I do actually want to say something about sizing. I feel like I say this about every time I do a child size pattern because... Uh, Whilst I will always use just numbers and measurements for adults, uh, you don't always have children around to measure. Uh, sometimes they're not even born when you start knitting it, right? So I put ages on them, but I always put a big kind of disclaimer, children are different, they're just as different as we are. And it's just like, my nephew is just about to turn a year old and he wore the size two years old. <laughs> Which I could kind of predict in advance when I started knitting it. I'm like, he, he's a big boy. I think, I think we're gonna. <laughs> I, I'm just gonna err on the side of caution and have him wear a size two, given that he was gonna wear it for the winter, which is, you know, yet to come. And the thing generally about children's patterns is that you always want to choose the size that is basically the size above where they're at, generally, depending, because a size is usually up to that age if it's a size one years old well they can wear it until they turn one sort of give or take right but you know children are going to vary they're going to be a bit smaller or larger than the size given for that age so I mean if you can I would just measure the kid and add you know about five centimeters two inches positive ease or just err on the side of caution like I did and I just do a bigger size and at some point it will fit <laughs> so that's the general advice there I think is is the best. Uh, we had a lot of people knitting him kind of, you know, newborn sizes when he was born and he was already, we knew he was going to be born a big boy, so uh, whilst most of it fit, it fit for a very short period of time and it would have been a lot better if he had something that was just bigger that he would have been too small for to begin with but then it would have lasted longer because now my sister just has so much knitwear that fit for such a short period of time. Um, so that's sort of, I guess, the things I've learned about children sizing while doing all this stuff. I'll even put a discount code here now while I remember to mention it because it's very easy to forget. Uh, the rule is the same with all my discount codes and I, you know, it always helps me as a designer to have people who buy my patterns when they're new so that more people see them because it puts them in like trending algorithms and things like that. I don't even know how that stuff works. But I do recognize that people don't have to buy things until they're costing on. So the fact that they want to, to support me, I'm always like, yeah, you can save 20%. That's a give and take. That's a fair deal. I'm just, that's that's good for everyone. <laughs> so that's that's the rule of that. But they are only valid for a few days for that reason. So just, just so you are aware in case you're seeing this video in a year's time or whatever, <laughs> or in a week's time even. So let's look at the new pattern. Oh, I'm going to regret the light situation now because this pattern was absolute hell to photograph because it's made in such lovely but dark yarn. Do you guys want to go outside? Are people going to think I'm weird if we go outside? The answer is yes, but also, do I care? 
Okay, that kind of worked out. You are going to have to enjoy the sound of London. I have lots of loud neighbours and barking dogs and loud helicopters and screaming children, so that's going to be all good. But hey, we're outside on the patio. Who knew? I'm going to feel so awkward if someone walks by. We have this like shared patio situation, so this is like a sidewalk. <laughs> but I can show you my new vest design. Yeah, I fully throw myself on on the vest bandwagon. I don't know if you know this. I don't I don't know what's going on in knitting, to, to be perfectly honest, but I have noticed that there is something happening with vests. And I was like, finally, my time has come. No sleeves. <laughs> was that too intense? I'm also trying out a new microphone, so this could be awfully wrong. And I am very sorry if the sound is unusable. Maybe I should whisper. Oh dear. Um, yeah, now oh, we have a vest and it is the librarian vest. Shock and horror or, or something. Maybe I should try it. You know, we're gonna try it on because it's actually not that warm. I actually found an end in here that I haven't woven in. How do I do this? There we are. <laughs> now you can tell how easy it is to put on. Uh, so yeah, the whole vest thing, I mean, I don't know what's going on with vests, but they seem to be everywhere and I don't, I mean, you guys know, I'm, I'm like all I do is design like mid-century Norwegian inspired stuff. I don't typically throw myself on the trends. I mean, the only times I've been trendy is when color work just happened to get trendy and I was already doing it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, no sleeves. Sign me up. So this is the librarian vest. Maybe I should get up so you can see. Um, there she is. Okay, thank you, Focus. Thank you, Loud Car. So, what can we say about this adorable little vest? Well, uh, it's made in Rauwerk <laughs> Merino DK. So, it's a German Bavarian Merino. You've heard me talk about their, that yarn a ton of times, so I don't know if there's anything else that I can add to that really but I do really really like this yarn it's just the perfect mix of whatever qualities that everyone seems to love about merino and the fact that you can steek this yarn with no problems not that I did I put steeks I did not put steeks in this pattern it's all knit in the round up to the underarm uh front flat and then the two fronts separately flat and the the back is worked flat it's not steeks but you could if you want to modify um I have steeked raw work yarn in the past with the Mood back on card again. Words are not coming to me today. Um, but yeah, I don't know what else there is to say about this. Really, the construction is very simple, nothing too controversial. Um, it's again quite easy to adapt for different shoulder widths. So if you have broader shoulders than me, you simply can omit some of the decreases that happen along here. But if you have more narrow shoulders, which then you just want to decrease a bit more, it's, it's very easy. Also, if you just don't want to decrease, you can have like a drop sleeve kind of vest thingy. So that's also an option. But yeah, I do also want to give uh, an extra shout out to this yarn because this color, as much as it's just painful to capture on camera, which is why this is so overexposed and I'm looking so pale, is because the yarn is very dark and you want to, you know, show the the stitch pattern and doing that in photography with like a beautiful Norwegian fjord behind me that was very light it was just oh so so difficult but I can highly recommend this yarn in this colorway it is just peak skander color just yeah thanks Christine for for making this yarn and just, yeah raw work it is great and I still have so much left of this yarn because I bought it for like some kind of massive robe pattern I was initially gonna make, but I ended up buying it on two occasions and slightly different dye lots, so I'm not entirely sure what we're gonna do with all the other yarn. I could probably make another two or three vests out of it. <laughs> the Skane and Knits Rauwerk vest series, can you imagine that? that? That'd be a thing. But honestly, given how quickly this worked up, you know, given this is also, um, I mean, it's the same <laughs> gauge and everything and needle size as the Librarian 1C and pullover, it was, yeah, it was a quickie. I'm trying to think of the needles I used. That's probably not gonna be meaningful to you anyway because we all knit at different tensions, but I did use, you know, this sort of worsted to iron leaning yarn and I probably, 5.5 millimeter, I reckon. That's usually <laughs> when other people use five or less. 
the tight knitters unite. That's just that's what we do. I've got my show notes inside now, so I have no idea what we're gonna talk about. Let me just let me just have a sneak peek. You know what? I'm gonna show you a work in progress, but it's an upcoming design. <laughs> I don't know when I last did that. It's always been like, oh, suddenly there's a designer and it came out of nowhere. Uh, I do knit them and uh, <laughs> they, do, they do show up sometimes. So can we just adjust this camera? This is driving me absolutely loopy. See, that's better, isn't it? Now it's, my head's chopped off. Okay. It's, it's, we're, gonna, we're just gonna work with that. I, uh, I have been working with cardigan for a long time because I had so many other things I have been working on that this just sort of, I guess, was the thing that I landed on when I was between projects because it's all stockinettes and it's an upcoming cardigan pattern and it's made in also shock and surprise uh, Hillesvog yarn. This is their 100% pelt wool. I'm fairly certain I bought this at Knit Latitude here in London which is pretty much my only source for Hillesvog in London right now. I was whining and crying and complaining about this last time we spoke but you know I don't get access to any Hillesvog now. It's really hard to get from Norway. And now nobody from mainland Europe wants to really ship to UK last time I checked. And yeah, there's just knit with attitude that have the pelt wool and that's pretty much my options. So lucky those of you on the mainland. But oh, this yarn is so lovely. It's certainly not the worst, you know, only option to have. And it certainly won't be the last time I designed with it. In fact, it's not the first time either, because it's what I used for the troll tin cardigan, but I held it double there. Uh, here it's held single, so it's more of a light DK. And I'm working at a 20 stitch gauge, which is a pretty typical DK gauge. So we're just gonna call it a stock in a DK cardigan. Um, it's worked top down and it has steaks. So ha, huh, you're getting your steaks if anyone was missing those and wondering if I'm feeling okay. Um, <laughs> There are steaks, there's steaks for the armholes, there's gonna be steaks for the cardigan front opening, which is all the way from here all the way down. There's none of the separate steaks for our neck opening and, and body here. It's all such a curl in mess now because I've just done the button bands and until blocking. It's just gonna be like that. So there, this is giving you a idea. I think it's a simple, quite deep V-neck. I think actually the V goes slightly below the armhole, at least it did for my I think question mark of course I chose the right <laughs> I adore this color and really all I have left is the massive massive sleeves because I've also just finished off the the rib of the body I mean of course I did the rib of the bodies before the button band it's a very simple construction <laughs> which I always say but this time it's true um, where have I attached this to here I, I, I make a lot of decisions sometimes how, how were we to know? What I was going to show you is, I've actually done the sleeves. Um, <laughs> you are supposed to pick up the sleeves around the, the armhole and just knit them down in the round. But I needed something on the go and I didn't want to bring the whole card again. So what you can do is just cast on the sleeves. So I have just some provisional cast on here and just done that in a different color. And then I just knitted the sleeves from that and to the given length. So. I have the sleeve and what I'm going to do <laughs> is pick up stitches for the arm uh, around the armhole and then I'm going to just Kitchener stitch graft these two together so I'm going to have to put these stitches onto the needle so I can do that easily. Is it adding more steps than necessary? Absolutely yes. Uh, I just didn't want to carry everything with me all the time so actually this thing is done. We just have to you know imagine <laughs> that we just gotta imagine, right? Sleeves and and a body. See, it's basically a finished cardigan. Just need some, yes, a lot of grafting and uh, some buttons. I'm gonna go with slightly bigger and fewer buttons than I normally do for this one. It's just kind of the look that I was going for. It's very generic. Like I'm sure there's like 20 existing patches like it, which was making me kind of. It's probably why I've held on to it for a while because it isn't like, you know. You're not gonna see it from far away like, ah, oh, that is a skein deer, you know? <laughs> it's it's more of a just staple, wardrobe staple kind of thing. I mean, again, this is following the series of stuff that I wanna wear that I also wanna knit. And so that's why it's looking the way it is, but also why it's got, you know, three steaks and worked in the round and top down and all that stuff you probably come to expect. Though, as you may have noticed, I've kind of warmed up to bottom up. 
I think the more you know about what suits you, the more you can just do that. And I also think, as I've said before, shush. Oh, there's dogs barking all day here and all night. Everyone's been getting a dog and nobody knows how to train them. And as someone who used to work as a family run dog breeding business, it's just a bit, Okay, I know there's people watching here who know that I've had dogs that did not stop barking and are like, Ellie, are you really the one to talk? Like, I'm not. But here's the thing, if you know you have dogs that are gonna bark, you don't leave them outside unattended. You stop them when they start barking. You run after them like a lunatic and make everyone in your neighborhood think you're absolutely bonkers. But no, not in London. You just let them bark, apparently. Did anyone come to hear me talk about this? No, maybe not. <laughs> So as I was saying, I do think things like satin sleeve silhouettes, like this one, which it doesn't have any sleeves set in, thank goodness, vest, oh, no sleeves. But it's that arm size shaping, when you're decreasing along here, that is so much easier to do bottom up, because like I said, you want to adjust for shoulder width. Oh, so much easier to just take one out or add one, you know, and then you just do the remaining length to get your arm hole. Uh, the other way around, you got to know how much mini rows you have left before you go to join for the under here. Um, it's just a lot harder to estimate because you, you can't put the the increases. It's a very loud plane. What else is not loud here? Why did I move to city? Anyway, <laughs> questions we're asking ourselves on the daily since lockdown. If you wanted to increase, right, you have to know, okay, I got to do that in f on the final few rounds. You got to know how many rounds you have left. And it's just a little bit more thinking, which you totally can do. It's usually what I do in my patterns, so you don't have to, but like, you have a lot more modification power for satin sleeves bottom up than you do for satin sleeves top down. Um, but this one really has very little underarm shaping. It does have a little bit and there's more underarm shaping for, so this one, not the one I'm wearing, uh, it's more underarm shaping, the bigger size that you have. So what that does is just so that the drop of the shoulder is sort of equal across sizes. So it's, <laughs> are you gonna be allowed to, are all the planes just gonna be doing this today? Okay, hi. Uh, <laughs> So basically, you don't end up having a bigger uh, drop for bigger sizes because they're going to have a bigger bust, right? So then you get a bigger drop, but I've just adjusted for that across sizes, so it should fit about the same. I think either is fine depending on what you're going for in your design. It just so happens to be that this was what I was going for. It's sort of half drop, if you will. <sighs> it's getting quite dark out here as well, so now I can barely show you the vest. So the timing today is either really bad or really good. <laughs> I'm gonna move this work in progress indoors and I'm gonna put it in a visible place where I can see it and be reminded to just graft on those sleeves and, I don't know, find some buttons online because I don't have buttons this size actually. And then I can talk about sweater weather. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm just gonna come here with all my new yarn. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is honestly for me for a yarn show, for a first yarn show after a year and a half. It's kind of modest. I, am I? Am I okay? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it's not, that's not a very comforting answer. I'm fine. But I made it quite late to sweater weather. So for those of you who don't know, it's a very small yarn event that happened for the first time in Farnborough. So it felt very similar to. Um, <laughs> I had to get my phone. Unravel. It felt very similar to Unravel because it's the same venue, I believe the same organizers, and I only heard about it last minute, by accident. So I sat home Friday morning for a few hours just like, am I gonna go? Am I going? Is it okay if I go? It's a pandemic. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I just wasn't sure. And I just eventually just went like, I'm not gonna regret. I'm gonna be so happy I went. I'm just gonna go. And so I went. and bought the wrong train ticket and ended up in the wrong place. Uh, not too far away, but you know, you'd think someone who's been to Unravel for how many years would know the difference at this point between Farnham and Farnborough. But uh, no, I uh, ended up in Farnham first and it was like, as soon as I went off the train, just, no, I know what I've done. Oh no. So I was already late and then I was more late. So I was more there after noon at some point. Uh, <laughs> So it wasn't that much time to buy yarn actually, in my defense, but I had a lot of time to talk to people. Like people, not people on Zoom people, like people people. And it was really nice. I probably, I am someone, like you know a lot of people when they don't see people for a long time, they're just like, I don't know how, 
how do you talk? And I, yeah, I'm, I'm like that too, but more than anything, I talk excessively. <laughs> so that that's me when I'm out of practice, it's just like, I have lost practice in how to shut up. So it was very nice to meet everyone and I hope you didn't mind. <laughs> But yeah, instantly I saw people who I recognized and said hi to and I'm just really glad I went and also It was not crowded like crowd control went either really well or just a lot of people were hesitant about going understandably so Yeah, it was felt like a very soft start to maybe returning to to yarn shows or or not um, Definitely safe to measures were in place. I was just really pleased with, with the whole thing um, <laughs> Just try not to worry about this noise But what was really interesting about the whole thing is that after me having just been there for a few hours that it was until it closed, I was knackered and everyone were knackered and it was like the most mundane, quiet, like not mundane in a bad way, just like, you know, a few people and just chill, it was just chill. And we were as knackered as I am normally after like however many days Edinburgh Yarn Festival is, plus the bonus day, which I think is like four days, five if we count warm up knit nights and it's just, I'm like a, I have like a, I'm like drunk on yarn, like I have like a, a knitting hangover. I'm just like not there, but to have that after just a few hours at a show that isn't that big at all. Interesting, I think. <laughs> We've all been a bit sensitized and it's nice to be in the same boat about that. I think everyone were very understanding and it was quite lovely and just really nice to see knitwear in person again. I. I mean, I haven't really been casting on a whole lot this year, which is also a little bit worrying. And I think part of it is that I haven't really felt very in touch with the knitting community. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, various websites, etc. plus Instagram algorithm, where we've already talked about that. I think a lot of us are feeling like we can't really reach each other the way we used to. And so seeing people and seeing knitwear, I was like, hell yeah. And there was someone wearing, and I noticed this at the very end when they had like this knitting group together. Someone was wearing this sweater and I had to ask them because they were all wearing it and someone were knitting it. And I was like, what is this sweater? And it was the Lady Whistledown sweater, which is a top-down raglan with this beautiful like sleeve pattern feature. So I promptly bought that pattern. I thought I'd give it a shout out here. But I'm actually quite eager to cast on. And I'm thinking the best way to justify it might just be to frog an existing whip, which is frustrating because I actually really do want that whip but I don't think the yarn and the whip the yarn and the pattern uh, matched up so well it just feels very heavy for the the gauge that that pattern is in it was for DK I just think I had a very heavy DK so I might just frog do the whistle down the lady whistle down raglan and just do that other raglan in a different yarn <laughs> so that's that was the social part, I guess. I mean, I ran into so many lovely people. And first people I saw was, um, I'm gonna shout out them on, on Instagram, um, uh, Salima Jane Arch and Fruitful Fusion. You can check them both out on Instagram. Amazing uh, fiber artists, uh, Salima uh, did actually along like this, this drawing. So Fruitful Fusion is a, a dye company uh, <laughs> who do just amazing colors. I think I have a skin of her somewhere, but I'm not entirely sure, but yeah. Big shout out. I actually was gonna go back there and just buy a skein, but then actually it closed because I was just talking to people and I had no not enough time to buy yarn. Same with Travel Knitter yarn that was there and I'm like, it's been a while since I bought myself some Travel Knitter and the bugs are coming now. My life is over. <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah, Salima was making this drawing. She was making this long drawing of the entire event. And I was sort of joking that since I seem to be following her around because we ended up in the same rooms. That I should be like, you know, when a person can show up several places in a panorama photo. <laughs> I didn't, but I'm a close one. Uh, yeah, it was really good to see people. I, I could shout out everyone, you know, Fiber Company, Little Grey Sheep, Knit with Attitude, uh, Keith and Siona, which I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah, I just want to give a shout out to everyone, but my memory is absolutely failing me. And look how dark it is now, so I can barely show you the yarn that I got. So I think I'm going to have to hurry up and, and do that. So I'm going to start off with Caithness yarn because I was still in my looking around when I got this, this cone, um, which I said, I was like, I am really not buying it, I'm just looking. And he just he talked and talked and just about how they get their yarn from farmers, sheep farmers in the north of Scotland and how it's all these sheep breeds. It was even someone I hadn't heard about. And I have Katie Green's sheep poster up on my bedroom right above my bed. I look at that every day, I'm like, ah, oh, British sheep. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm fine, I swear. <laughs> and so that was amazing, just like the, the depth of knowledge. And I mean, he could have just made up sheep breeds for all I know, but you know, <laughs> it was just this just incredibly just passionate speech about how they're you know, making sure that the wool and the fleece doesn't go to waste and they can produce yarn and shush. <laughs> and just, I obviously had to buy the yarn. I mean, the different blends as well and just, and also the fact that I was just like, oh, you're from north of Scotland, where exactly is Caithness? And he's like, oh, just, just south of Orkney. And I was like, do you know John? Right, a very generic name, what am I thinking? Anyway, he's like, yeah, John Glenn. I'm like, yeah, Brady Chill, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're watching. I don't know if you watch this stuff anymore. I'm like, I don't know. If. Anyway, uh, so that's that's nice. North of Scotland sounds like just my thing. I, it's, if there's, you know, there's one John. Everyone knows him. <laughs> it's good. So I I got this cone, which is just so nice. I actually thought it was going to be a little bit harsher when I felt it in in the festival, but I think it's just because the festival was quite warm. It was quite a, like a warm, damp British late summer day. Uh, and as I've said before, yarn tends to feel itchier if the weather's just less appropriate to wear it. And when I felt it when I came outside, I was like, oh, this is nice and soft. I mean, I'm not saying it's merino, it's just, it's really nice. Like, I, w I wanna wear this, like, it's, it's fine here. And I actually did feel that when, if you ever, if you're curious about buying Caithness yarn, which I highly suggest, not that I would tell you what to buy, but if I was gonna tell you what to buy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I felt a lot of the other yarns and the white ones, felt a little harsher than the darker yarns. And that's something I find across breeds a lot, is just darker fleecing a little bit softer. I don't know why, if there's a specific breed that is always blended in, or what that is, but I got this cone. So oh, I don't know how much this is. He estimated for me about 700 meters of iron weight yarn. So it probably won't be like a, you know, a cable iron sweater. I think I would need more yarn for that, but I could certainly, get you know a, a nice little yoke out of it let's see what it's called no this is no information that we can make use of i am so sorry <laughs> but it's lovely just give you a little close up here there we are look at that so i got a matching little white cake of you i'm like <laughs> the amount of willpower it takes me to not complain about the dog barking um Honestly, I've tried. I've called noise pollution. I've called so many, and it's the same dog owner. Like it's no mystery, and it's just. And this dog has attacked all the dogs walking by this summer like three times, and I was like this ready, but they built up a new fence, and that's not going to happen anymore. So I think if I have both of these, I could do a yoke. I have no idea what it would look like. It would be iron weight, which I don't know if I have done, because stone wood is chunky but this could potentially work on chunky way as well i don't know i could do stonewood but why would i do another stonewood if i could do a whole new sweater design so and i could do someone else's design too maybe if there's something around you know so yeah this is like a very dark brown in case you can't tell i know the the light here is quite warm but it is a very dark brown so you wouldn't mistake it for black by any means um but it's it's dark which i do like it <laughs> seems to be the story today. I don't know if you can see the vest anymore. <laughs> it, it's still here. But yeah, the white yarn actually feels a lot softer out here too. So I think it's just like when you go to a yarn show and it's very hot and it's just a lot of people, even though there wasn't, in this case, usually that would make it warmer. And you feel the yarn and it's very easy to, to dismiss the yarn for being, you know, itchy and stuff. But I would highly just encourage you to remember that, you know, when it's a little bit colder or even just cold um, the yarn feels a lot softer because that's just when when you're supposed to wear it I only find yarn to be excessively itchy when it's just too warm to wear it um, so that's just something to think about if you wanted to think about something today <laughs> so anyway I knew this yarn was gonna come home to me as soon as I saw it because okay so I've been knitting with Lore by the Fibre Company in the past. Um, I was actually really lucky to be sent their yarn before it came out. So I was gonna knit a beta sample and I was like 85% or 90% or something ready, like finished with the project before they launched the yarn and then just a lot of life stuff came up and I didn't finish in time and it's still not done. And I don't know why, cause it's so close. And of course the yarn's been around for a few years now and they now launched this new colorway. And although I'm not sure it's showing up too well in this light, 
as you can probably imagine, it's pretty heckin' burgundy. It's a very, like, berry color, I would say, like, kind of on the red side of, of purple. It looks very red on here. <sighs> okay. Maybe it's time to go inside. I think we're gonna go inside. All right, so we're back in here, and I guess I can show you the yarn again. Yay, cool. Slightly better, isn't it? I'm gonna say it has a little bit more on the pink side of it than it's showing up. Obviously we have very golden light. It's fake light, indoor light, artificial. But I got, <laughs> I'm, I got five, yeah. So I have no idea what this is gonna be yet, but obviously it had to come on with me, isn't that what we say? But I do think like one sweater quantity, I mean, no, two, uh, <laughs> isn't too bad for yarn show. If you know my track record, um, so I don't know what it's gonna become. It's just, it's going into the stash. And I do wanna defend like kind of my past uh, yarn expenses as well, because it's easy to forget, you know, you see just, oh my God, you bought so much yarn, you bought so much yarn. I was like, yeah, but I didn't buy a bunch of single skeins that I'm not gonna use. I buy sweater quantities because I make sweaters. <laughs> so I never buy a quantity that I don't know can be used for specific things. If I buy a single skein, I'm like, that is a hat. If I buy two, I'm like, that is mittens. If I buy a sock yarn skein, that's like, that's a pair of socks, you know, and this is a sweater quantity. And I guess the only quantity that it's hard to buy for is shawls, but I actually don't knit that many shawls, so that's fine. And yeah, so that's kind of my thinking. That's often why I end up with a obscene amount of yarn because it's a sweater, right? Anyway, what else is there? Oh, I bought Lane. I haven't looked through this yet, so I don't really have much to say, but I just said I bought Lane uh, uh, Knit With Attitude. Um, it was really nice to see them again too. Uh, if you don't know, Maya who runs Knit With Attitude is from my hometown, so you know, it's nice to just talk to someone who's from Trondheim, which, I mean, to be fair, I've been there this summer. I mean, Maya just went now for the first time since how long? Um, so... <laughs> just really good to, to have a chat and to see my sweater on display. Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, the designs from uh, the Knit With Attitude book that I had my pattern in uh, were there, but mine was on the model, on the mannequin, on the thing, on the thing on the shelf. That was like, I gotta show you a photo, because like, oh my God. Uh, I remember being like so stressed out when I was making it for like, I just felt like it wasn't working out. And I'm like, oh no, it's terrible, it's horrible, oh, it's the worst ever. And like, now that I'm seeing it finished and have a bit on a distance, I'm just like, oh, it's, it's I, I, this is this is no reflection of the design. This is just me being like very harsh on myself when I design <laughs> and seeing it there, you know, having been blocked and being, you know, taken well care of and just, I'm just like, yes, that's... I blocked it by the way, I didn't leave it to them, I'm just saying. Um, having it, you know, not looking at it from the critical lens of someone who's like watched every stitch as, knit, as I was knitting it. I'm just really proud of that one and feel good about having it in that book and just yeah another item from uh sweater weather that i was given which oh my god i i just feel very spoiled <laughs> but i also have not had time to look through yet and that is this gorgeous just booklet by i'm gonna try to pronounce things correctly arnold culliford knitwear confident knitting which i have actually had my eyes on this one for a while and i do generally just really like what they put out in terms of just knitting technical stuff that gets people's confidence up and makes people want to explore different things in knitting instead of, you know, settling for what you know. And I just, I'm all, I'm all here for that. Uh, who's shocked? Not me. <laughs> and, and yeah, I just thought I would uh, give a shout out to the designers mentioned on the back in case that makes you maybe curious about this thing. I feel like, you know, giving a bit of a mention. Uh, they so can, kindly gave it to me, even though I haven't read it yet because life happened. Uh, so contributors at the back here is of course, Jenna Arnold Crawford. Jim Arnold Culliford, Martina Bem, Jeanette Budge, 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 uh, Carol Feller, <laughs> Lily Kate Franz, hi, uh, Hunter Hammerson, Gudrun Johnston, Jimmy Nezier, said hi Jimmy, um, Joseph, sorry, pronunciation, uh, Noma Dulovu, sorry, that was probably not right, uh, Jeanette Sloan, hi Jeanette, uh, Marceline Smith, hi Mars, uh, <laughs> Kay Williams, Kay Cardiner, and Aunt Shane. Uh, sorry, that was incredibly cringe. I hope you can forgive me for all the things I just did that was terrible right now. But yeah, oh my God, so many friends in here. I didn't even realize until I read this up. That's, that's dude, just doing my due diligence here as a reviewer of things. <laughs> 
But yeah, amazing to see so many good notes on here and I'm a tad bit jealous, but yeah. So yeah. There's actually something here with color work as well. I believe it's about catching floats. So for those of you who are interested in that, so I haven't talked about that intensively, you might want to check that out. Uh, that's my shout out. That's my big thank you for giving me this. Um, yeah. I think time has come for the lamp. <laughs> okay, it's gonna be fun. I am trying not to take this too seriously, but I'm obviously gonna take it seriously that I have been given a lamp from uh, BenQ. Uh, the story behind it was kind of funny to me almost because uh, I don't know if you know, but like if you have an Instagram with a certain number of followers, you do get sent messages from like weirdo accounts that are like, we will help you make money. We wanna do this for you. And it's, still, it's just like lots of scams. And you're just like by ref like new jerk reaction, just wanna like block. And I was like, hang on a minute. Ben Q. I know Ben Q. I looked at Ben Q monitors when I was gonna buy my, my monitor. They've got good monitors. They want to send me a lamp. I mean, I'm looking. And then first I was like, what is a lamp to do in knitting? And then I realized I've actually been looking for a lamp that is gonna like help me with productivity in the darker season. Like that has actually been a problem for my of mine for years. And as I was thinking more about, it, not only has it been a thing that I've been looking for, but I happen to know that many knitters are very light sensitive. If there's one thing we learned from the past few years is the light sensitivity of of many knitters and photo sensitivities and all that stuff. So I thought, you know what? I think this is gonna work out. I, I'd actually quite like to try this now. So I said yes and they sent me the lamp and it's real fancy. And it is no cheap lamp either, to be fair. I'm gonna put the name on. I think, I believe this is the one called Genie. I was gonna put some of my footage over where I kind of assembled it, which was really easy. Uh, no problem there, no complaints. So I'm gonna show you my first impression, literally as I'm having it right here, is when I put it on. So the on button is this, you touch the ring. And here comes my first bout of negativity. I wanna probably preface this by saying, um, if you don't like people giving their honest opinion, negative or positive, about a item they're giving for review, then maybe, I was gonna say maybe you shouldn't watch this, but honestly, maybe you just shouldn't watch reviews. <laughs> I'm very grateful for being given this thing, especially considering the price point, but I don't understand why there is a touch ring when you could just have a switch that you can click. What's wrong with the switch? I have the same thing with my precious, precious Sony headphones. Why can't I just use a button? Why do I have to do the double tappy thingy to pulse? And like, it's so annoying. <laughs> I'm like, a button is so much more reliable. That's my first. But hey, that's just me. For some people, uh, buttons can be difficult to operate. So this, look at that. So the first thing that I reacted to was that when I put it on, it was like this. I'm like, oh God, that is bright. Like it gets bright. Like this is bright lamp. And I was like, is this a photosensitive people? I mean, that's not how it's advertised. The, and it also can go to a very white light. And it can go very warm, let's see. So the, the way it's operated is you click, uh, this is my other complaint. <laughs> We're just doing all of it now. Um, it's very easy to hit this one while you're operating the wheel. So that's the other reason I'm like, why is this a touch wheel? Why is it so close to the wheel? I end up switching it on and off when I'm really just operating the wheel. It's kind of annoying. And on top of that, if you unplug it, the settings you have done in terms of adjusting the hue, so this is the hue, right? Which is what I was talking about before I digressed. So you can make it warmer. And honestly, it only makes sense to use this in the dark, because otherwise it's just light outside and you don't need a lamp unless you're in a dark room, uh, which the same thing applies. This feels absolutely terrible to use when it's dark. It's so white. Big no. So I have to turn it all the way to the warm setting. And there, it's actually quite nice if I can get it all the way there. Is this it? There we are. Now it's on the warm setting and it's at the lowest setting. And that is really a very nice setting, but it's the only setting I can use. And that is sort of my mixed bag take on this, is that I have to turn... I accidentally switched it off again. I have to turn it all the way down to the warmest hue and the lowest brightness 
And I like that setting. I really like that setting. It's actually some of the best softly distributed light that I have had in any desk lamp ever. There's no desk lamp for me that has actually uh, outshined this one. Poor pun intended, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but at the same time, it's this very high price point lamp of I think 150 pounds. And the only features it has is touch wheel, hue, um, brightness and a slight angle. <laughs> so I, as I like this light and it feels very nice and soft and it really distributes well into the room, I would like to be able to make use of the whole range. And if the range doesn't go any lower, I really can't. So that's my personal experience, but I am really emphasizing personal experience here because you're talking about a person who has every device on night mode and dark mode 24 seven. So if you aren't like me in that regard, this might actually be amazing for you and you would feel like the whole range would suit. Um, but for me, this is still a bit too bright. Now, actually it wouldn't be too bright if it was a little bit further away from me, but this lamp is only this long, if you can get it here. So I'd have to put it up on a shelf behind me because <laughs> when it's too light, it's, this distribution doesn't really count, right? Because it doesn't get a lot of distance to distribute. Um, so it just hurts, like the LED lamp is quite painful and I just wish it had like a hood or a cap or something because that would help, that would solve a lot of issues. But now it's just like, it hurts my periphery when I'm like having it like here and I, my desk is here. I kind of have to have it behind me. But even then it's sort of like, <sighs> if it was just further up and further away. And so <laughs> I checked and they have three versions of this lamp, one that has more of a, was it called like an elbow lamp? Like it has like an extra joint that you can, it's, I, there's a word for this. The, the, you know, what desk lamps have, uh, which I would have thought would have been much better to send, honestly. It is more expensive, granted. But if I were them and I was gonna ask a knitter to give this review to other knitters, that's probably the one I would have sent because this is a desk lamp and it's probably pretty good at desks, but on desks? But we're knitters. We're not going to be sitting on a desk. Actually, the light's quite nice now because I have it turned away from me so it doesn't hurt my eyes. And this is nice. Uh, I do have to have it turned facing my flatmate though, so that's not very nice to her. So I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to try it more upstairs actually on my desk. But I kind of wanted to emphasize this that we knitters, when we knit, most of us will sit in very cozy, comfortable spaces like a sofa or a sofa chair. And really only option, option to have it anywhere is on a, a coffee table. And it's just not very tall for that. So I would have rather had the slightly taller desk lamp or better yet, the, the standing lamp, which they also have, which I would have thought would have been perfect. So out of the three models, they for some reason sent me the, the one that I think is the least suitable for knitting and probably more suitable for just desk work. Uh, so I, I really don't know why. I wish if, you know, I was a paying customer, I'd probably have it uh, exchanged for the either taller desk lamp or the standing lamp, because I think that would have been really good. Because again, the selling point of this lamp, which is like the soft light that is very distributed into the room and is good for, you know, having that nice work light, especially in the dark hours when you feel like it's night and you don't want to work. Uh, yeah, it's like it has all this potential. And yet I just wish it had just a little bit more, like a little bit more maybe length adjustment, uh, hood to soften up the light a bit when it's in my periphery. Um, honestly, uh, more ways of angling the light than just simply turning it forwards like this. Cause yeah, now I can have the lamp further away from my work, but it's lower now um, <laughs> and more in my face. This is like, this is the distance right from work to, you see, well, it's like standing on my boob now. There's the distance from work to desk, from lamp to desk, wow, I can't talk. It's just not very long and the, the light just becomes too harsh for that, evidently. I'm just not, it's just, let's turn it away again. This is the lower setting, I keep emphasizing this. So I just, if it could have been made more dim, had more of a shield or a cap or a hood or something, a little bit taller or more adjustable, oh, I would have loved it, would have been great. But I feel like saying, 
so kind of what I'm concluding with, even though I can only speak from the perspective of someone with fairly light, light sensitivities, it's more of a seven out of 10 for me, six out of 10 maybe, depending. Maybe it's eight out of 10, it's somewhere around there. It's average, it's seven out of 10. But I think for someone who don't have light sensitivities, this would probably be perfect. But then again, maybe many desk lumps would be. So I, I really don't know, I can't honestly speak for you. I guess at the end of the day, I feel like it's nice, it's fancy, it feels very high end. It's got a very heavy base. The lamp is quite heavy because it's got this heavy base, so it's not gonna just topple over. It's very steady and sturdy on the desk, which uh, my other desk lamps can't say the same. And it stands up very sturdily. It's nothing flimsy about it. It feels like a solid build. I don't love how it looks. It's got this nice swivel head, so if I try not to touch anything that is touch sensitive, I can swivel it around a little bit. Yeah, I touched everything now. But how, how are you gonna do that if... So I can like turn it away from me like this. So I don't have to be bothered by this light, which is nice. And it, I can touch this lamp as well because it's LED so it doesn't run hot. And when I say I don't love how this looks, I think, again, they wanted to know what knitters are gonna think about this. And I'm like, does this look knitting aesthetic to you? <laughs> Because it looks like something that goes well with my Dyson products, but that's about the nicest thing I can say about the design. It's very sci-fi. It's... I'm going to turn it off now. Because it's, it's bright. It's very sci-fi. It's, it's supposed to have this weird bend. It's not bendy. Um, limiting kind of the shielding option you could DIY. But given it's LED and it doesn't run hot, you could yarn bomb it. So any concerns about, you know, the aesthetic. You can't bomb it. I'm pretty sure that's fire safe, but don't quote me on that. I don't want anyone blaming me for any, uh, you know, maybe research that one. But it's got a cool way of like snapping the wire into the back of the lamp as well. So it's coming in here. So I can just like hold it in and push it in there so it doesn't get in the way. It's really nice. And you can just give it a bit of a bend here. This is like the, the, the wire here. So I can bend this forward without having to like get into trouble here. Same with bending it back. Not that I know why, I mean, I guess if I was actually gonna experiment a little bit with positioning this, I might actually get the brightness up, turn it up against a wall like this and just have it facing there and distribute. That's actually how we are uh, illuminating this living room, this lamp that we have from Ikea, it's a standing lamp and it's just standing up, pointing out away from us and just giving us a soft, soft living room light uh, in addition to the, to the fairy lights that we have here. So I'm kind of just saying that, so you know, that I'm, I might be a little bit funny about light and how bright they are and like the source and just the source seeing that in my periphery and I just it's sort of not great for me personally but each to their own so I might be the slight funny one here but that is kind of my conclusion with this lamp I think I don't know I don't love how it looks I think it has perhaps slightly too few features for the price point given exact especially that I can't take advantage of the full light and hue range <sighs> But the soft light is good and it is very nicely distributed. Um, it will be a very nice working desk lamp. So if you've been looking for that and you wanted to invest, I mean, hell yeah. But would I pay for it myself? I don't know, but maybe I would for the standing lamp. Um, though it's more expensive, so I, I don't know, give or take. Uh, so my review may sound a little bit lukewarm, but it's mostly positive, but I guess a little bit of a deep side that still I haven't quite found the perfect lamp that I've been looking for for years. Um, but it's close, and this is probably going to be the lamp that I'll be using in, you know, not have, when I don't have any other lamps. Um, if you guys are curious, if this review was like any interesting to you at all, um, beyond knitting, I am getting my desktop computer back from repair tomorrow, so I can actually try this on in terms of computer work, but I wouldn't just have, it wouldn't have anything to do with knitting. So that's just in case anyone is more interested in that purpose, because I think knitters are a bunch of nerds and we like computer work, so. <laughs> that is just something I could uh, supplement with. But I was asked to review this for uh, knitting work, and that's basically, uh, all that I had to say about that. Mixed bag, uh, I think positive for the average knitter, perhaps not so much for someone with uh, a lot of light sensitivities that is usable for me who has just some light sensitivities. So I think that's the conclusion. It's a very balanced review here. <laughs> so 
yeah, um, I was asked to put a bunch of links and stuff in, be in the description below in exchange for this review. So do make sure to, you know, click around those if you want to and I'll check out the information, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it felt like a fair trade to, to get this lamp to try out and just, yeah. It doesn't happen a lot when you're a knitting podcaster. I, I see all these other channels on YouTube. They don't have to be very big and they get to review all these products. And it's like, yeah, in knitting, we don't have that kind of resources. <laughs> so yeah, this was really nice to, to get to try out. And I hope it was, you know, useful information for anyone if you... Ooh, I just thought about something. I bet this lamp would be... Oh, yes. Suddenly this review got more positive. I, I think this would be really good for my knitting machine. I've had this... I can't believe I didn't think about this before. I'm literally looking at the knitting machine now. Because guess what? I, it's not moved since I did that front of the Susan Crawford blouse. Uh, way back when, early in the year. It's still hanging there and much to my flatmate's dismay, I was like, maybe we should think about finishing it soon. I'm like, yes, I know, you're right. She's going home to the States in a few days. So, so I'm gonna work a bit more on it when she's away because the sound is a little bit, you know, I, I don't wanna do that to anyone. And the problem's been that I haven't been able to work on it at night, in the evenings, because it's been dark, so I have to work on it during the day, but we work during the day from home. So now I'm like, this thing, with the knitting machine. Absolutely yes. I haven't tried it yet, but for now, right now, I'm just like, ooh, I'm feeling this. Okay, I just accidentally switched it on, just putting it on the floor. I'm not into the touch ring. I don't like the touch ring. Give, give me a switch. But I will be using it for, for the knitting machine. Uh, that might be a follow-up uh, when I get around to the machine. Hopefully I will get around to it when my flatmate's away because my Thank you, thank you for sending me this lamp. I hope this wasn't too shady. I just, you know, like to take uh, different um, points of view into account. But the knitting machine thing, I think, might really, really work because that is desk work. That is knitting desk work. So while I want to say like knitting isn't really desk work, you want to think about how we're sitting in this open, it might need a different type of lamp. But on the knitting machine, on the desk, I've just said that. Now, I was actually gonna wrap up this video now because I thought my flatmate was coming home, which is way too early, she literally just left. But it was just her delivery, so I think we're gonna get a little personal at the end, which we always do, don't we? So that's at the end of anything to do with knitting, to the extent that you feel like the lamp was knitting. <laughs> what can I say? Um, yeah, I did actually not realize that this Friday past, so Friday the 17th of September, marks my 10 year anniversary in London. Do you know the story of how I ended up here? Does anyone care? I mean, I'm gonna take my vest off because it's actually quite warm in here. I had no plans of moving to London. Many thoughts, wishes perhaps, but I, I made a few visits actually after my first year at university in Norway. I felt a little bit down because they changed the um, admission criteria to get into uh, this particular psychology course that I really wanted to get into so you could uh, apply with your first year psychology uh, grades and they, they changed that year so you had to use your uh, upper second year school grades but I was like those are not as good and I don't want to have to go back and change my maths and gym marks so I'm just really demotivated now even though I could continue on the bachelor's course I really just don't feel like it so I started just uh, escaping everything by traveling to London and just visiting and going to shows and at the end of that summer after two visits I was like oh, I don't want to I'm not, I'm just no motivation. I started looking into just, is there a way to just start studying? Because I just made some friends from the UK and they told me term hadn't started there, not for a long while. I was like, interesting. And after almost exactly four weeks after I inquired about whether I could apply to a UK university, I moved. I flew, I had a place to live in student halls and I had a place to study at a psychology bachelor's course in the center of London. And I've been at that university for 10 years. And the other day I actually went there to pick up my things. I went to the office for the first time in years. I actually stopped going there before lockdown because I felt a bit awkward for being someone who took seven years to finish a PhD instead of four. Really weird going back there. There wasn't anyone there except this one guy who appeared at the very end of my uh, getting all my things together in this box, who I used to teach as an undergrad. And I'm like, hi, I used to teach. I didn't say that, but... I and I, I met one lecturer who 
was like talking to her about what I want to do next. And she was like, yeah, we actually need lecturers now because we can only teach 30 students at a time. So I was like, sure, I can do that. And then apparently now I'm going back to be a lecturer again. It was so strange after having been there for 10 years and thinking back at how I had no intention of moving to London only in four weeks decided to just see if I could and then moved, I just flew two suitcases. And I was like, I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna try this. I'm just gonna do it for a year. I can do one year psychology there and just fit it into my degree in Norway and do the third year at home and it'll be done and it'll be fine. And at the end of the first year, I guess I was a bit overwhelmed and I hadn't quite understood the grading system. And I knew I hadn't done my best. Uh, Cause I, I literally, I sat in the classroom once with like friends on webcam and just like, you know, like I just not, not there, not dedicated. I had this one exam where you're supposed to write three essays in a very short space of time and I barely got started on the third one. And the average of marks, so that was a very low, I nearly failed. And I didn't understand the grading and I didn't understand that at the end of the first year I actually had averaged a first, which is like the best you can do. So I was like, I don't get this. Did I just do really well without trying? Did I just not do it? I don't, I'm, I'm confused. I paperwork, can't, no, I'm, let's just continue. It's easiest to just stay. I found a place and it was just a rubbish place in a five square meter room that I paid way too much to live in for way too long with way too cranky people. One in particular, he was not, he was a bit of an incel. Just, then I finally found this place just before I started this podcast. I'd been there for like, what? five years already and the first year or so was really good and then someone moved in that I was just not vibing with and that was when I, I was doing my PhD and it was just really hard to finish. I had gone through some crap at the same time as well and it was just all just meh. And then in the past year it's been great again. I mean my flatmate and I were getting on really well and just have a really nice atmosphere here. And just looking back at those years, I mean I did, I mean, I did my three year undergraduate degree and I was one of the best students in my year. How I mentioned that, I was a proper nerd in a good way. <laughs> I am proud that I did that well, but I was like, huh? And I wasn't really able to keep that up as a PhD student. And I felt really bad. And like, you know, I also felt like, you know, my supervisors accepted this really good student. And now I'm just like, I can't, I, I'm struggling with this very loose format of no deadline and I'm structuring everything. And that, you know, on paper sounded like my dream, but in practice, very difficult. And with like office politics as well, which don't even get me started. And just, it was hard. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I didn't think the imposter syndrome was like a problem, but I think it did become a problem that I kept feeling like I wasn't like worthy of the PhD and, and things like that. You know, the other students had like done a master's and done lots of research assistants and seemed to be just a lot more into it. Whereas I was still dabbling and you know, I was the youngest in the group pretty much the only one born in the 90s, you know, just about, but still, yeah, it was uh, quite difficult. And as I was there, I also got a lot of practice with marking exams and teaching and giving lectures. So I've like become a bit of a professional whilst, whilst doing all that. It was as someone who never had a job as a, a teenager, because I just couldn't, you know, brain. Uh, so it's, it's just been such a huge amount of growth in all these years, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so when things got really tough, I have this weird podcast I decided to start and people wanted my knitting patterns. Like I just developed my first pattern because, you know, Knit With Attitude, Maya who runs it, who's from my same my hometown, just wanted me to teach that knitting style there. And I was just like, okay, we're gonna do a pattern. We do the cyber mittens. And then you guys wanted that pattern. Then I made more patterns because more people were knitting that pattern. Just, <laughs> so that's kind of how that came about. And now I run a little business and I have my PhD. This, that's that's where I'm at. That's been my 10 years. That was a very, uh, probably undeserving summary. Uh, and I was gonna get to a point here instead of just being descriptive, but at the end of the day, I'm actually just not that person who came to London with two suitcases and just was like incredibly naive and just moving to the center of the, the big city. And I mean, all the stuff I've been through and the really bad experiences and the really good experiences and I swear I don't mean to like sound like I'm all that but I think I've just learned more about myself in these past 10 years than a lot of people do their entire lives things I was just like hadn't even entertained when I moved here and I'm just like oh and my mind just like expanded <laughs> wait I'm just 
Uh, one day I'm probably gonna go more in depth about that, but right now it's like still, you know, hitting me like 10 years in a place I wasn't even gonna stay. I had really no intention of, of moving like permanently. And it wasn't really until I found this place that I thought, hey, I can actually be here and have my things here instead of living in a suitcase. Which is why I've like done more things like having yarn and books and like a desktop computer and things like that. I mean, I own this sofa. <laughs> I own furniture now. Like it's <sighs> where I, I still quite don't quite know where I'm going with this, but I've often wondered why I enjoy being here or being not in Norway. Cause I'm sure many have wondered that as well. I mean, I seem to really like Norway. So what gives and honestly, I, I do. I do like Norway, but there's something that feels just really good and really right for me about being in a city like London, although like many other cities too, where there just aren't any cultural assumptions made so that lots of different people can exist together and we just make that extra allowance for everyone to just be. I don't meet someone and assume that they know everything that I do when I meet someone in Norway. I just think, hey, we come from all these different backgrounds and I'm not gonna start off with any assumptions we're just gonna be very open with each other and there's just something about that and I'm not just talking about you know different countries and cultures here I'm really talking about how this really applies very very broadly in terms of just down to personality traits even and just allowing for for difference and I'm sounding like I'm very much like oh it's just so great here like a lot of things a lot of places, London has its problems and, I'm, and I cannot even deny that. And I guess I'm just being vague deliberately and it sort of sounds like I, I'm applying it to everything. And I, But I guess to be a bit clearer about what I mean, it's more that when I compare it to where I am from, it's while a very beautiful place can be very conformist. And often if you don't fit a very, very specific sort of way of being, that can be really hard. And so it also limits who you can meet and just get to know and who you can be. And I being deliberately vague, but also because I want this to be something maybe everyone can resonate with in a way that maybe suits them. So make of that what you will. And that's, I think, is why I still like being here and why I would like to be either here or elsewhere that is in Norway, even though I love being from, from Norway and going back to Norway. And I think I'm gonna wrap things up here. But that was my little 10 years in London. I can't believe it. I can't believe I've become this person because I'm not that person 10 years ago. And I guess if I was gonna meet that person 10 years ago, I'd be like, oh boy, you have a lot to learn. <laughs> so yeah, thank you all so much for watching this episode. That was a bit extra. And I hope to see you guys next time. So, bye!